stage and it's my great pleasure to welcome here today, formerly of the Medical Research Council, a Met Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor Colin Blakemore. <laughs> going for Evan Harris, who's done so much for this event today. And for the remarkable Jenny, who started Sciences Vital only two weeks ago, and look what it's achieved already. And for Imran Khan, who you're going to hear in a moment, who's the director of the Campaign for Science and Engineering, who again has been leading the efforts to persuade the government up there about the stupidity of cutting science, cutting the hope for the future of our country. I, I used to be the chief executive of the Medical Research Council, and at that time, the budget of the entire Medical Research Council was one fortieth of the budget of the National Institute of Health, the equivalent organization in the United States. When I used to meet the director of the NIH, he used to say every time, how on earth does the MRC do it with so little money? And what it does is 29 Nobel Prizes so far. Amazing contribution. <laughs> and okay, maybe the politicians now, today, will say, what do we re really care about Nobel Prizes? It's the economy, stupid. But yes, we know that it's the basic research which is the engine of the economy in the future. Yes, the, the Medical Research Council has its 29 Nobel Prizes, but it also discovered penicillin, discovered the link between smoking and cancer, did the basic research that led to the development of MRI, the most important advance in diagnostics in the 20th century, and it invented monoclonal antibodies, the whole new generation of biological drugs. That's what comes out of funding basic research. someone of my age, this is terribly reminiscent of events in the 80s. Not meetings in the street. This is new. And I think the politicians up there should recognize how unusual it is for you guys to come out of the labs and onto the street. How passionate you feel about it. Back in the 80s, there were similar problems with science funding, and funding really fell through the 80s and the, uh, the early uh, 90s. And the consequences were clear. Universities ran down in their, in their status and in their infrastructure. Young people were leaving the country. That dreaded phrase, brain drain, was in the newspapers every day as good young people left. And we couldn't attract the best scientists from abroad to come and work here. It's taken 13 years of steadily increasing investment just to get us back to where we were in 1986, if they up there are arguing that British science must have too much fat, there must be useless research which is being done, they should look at the figures comparing us with other countries and what we achieve with what we spend. Britain's expenditure on, on science is amongst the lowest in the developed world, not full of fat. Uh, the um, investment is just over half of 1% of our GDP, half of 1% of our GDP invested in the future. Science, science culture, the knowledge that it brings, the quality of an informed public, and of course, the impact on the economy. The improvements in the last 13 years have revitalized British universities, now leading the world. Three, three universities in the top 10 in the world, according to one of the league tables. Cambridge just displacing Harvard as the best university in the world. And, and of course, Oxford not far behind. And instead of people leaving Britain, it's the best young scientists in the world coming to Britain now. Go into any lab and you'll see it's full of German research workers, it's full of Japanese research workers, it's full of Eastern Europeans, it's full of Americans coming here to work because they know that Britain at the moment is a good place to do science. We have 1% of the population, 12% of the citations, 14% of the most influential citations, second only to the United States in almost every area of science and first in some. 
We do brilliantly with a level of investment that most people don't understand. And if you ask those people what they're doing about the future of science, ask the Americans, ask the Swedes, ask the Germans, ask the Japanese, ask the people in Singapore what they're doing about the economic downturn, and they say, the only thing to do, the only sensible thing to do is to increase the investment in science, and that's what we're doing. So a few years ago, the European community set a target for total investment, total investment, public and private investment in research, of 3%, saying that's what's needed to compete now in the modern world, knowledge-based economy. Uh, even with the increases of the last um, 13 years, the last government set a target for Britain of only 2.5%. We are actually spending only 1.8% at the moment. We must do better if we're going to compete with the 3% of GDP that's being spent in the United States, more than that in Japan, much more than that in Finland, in Singapore, around the world, countries with which we have to compete. We, when the oil and the gas run out, we have no real natural resources. We've learned from the economic downturn that we cannot build a successful economy on the service sector and the financial industries. We can only do it on our wits. And our wits means you. You must be at the heart of the future of this country. Look, there are going to be people who say that we're out in the streets whinging like everyone else because, because we're likely to be cut. Why can't we just accept that everybody has to take the pain? Yes, some of you must be worried about your careers. Of course, you're mobile. You can always work anywhere as a scientist, but you are concerned about your careers and the future of science right now. But that's not the only reason that we're here on the streets. We are concerned about the future of our country. And this, this country... <laughs> and it has only one future economically. A future based on its wits, based on invention, based on innovation, and that means based on solid, well-funded science. So, if you look at the list of signatures on the Science is Vital petition, and I hope you've signed it all, just, by the way, I'm just told that it's just reached 24,000. <laughs> 24,000 in, in two weeks. Yes, of course, the great and the good of, of science are there. The Brian Coxes, the Patrick Moores, the Lord Reeses, and so on. But lots of non-scientists, ordinary people who have been moved to say that they recognize the arguments. They're worried about their own future, scientists or not, if the budget of science is cut. So thank you for coming here today. You're making a great stand. The presence of the media is really, really important to get our message out. And it's not just a selfish message. It's a message of concern about the country. Can I just say, finally, that on the 26th of October, and that's just a few days after the announcement of the Comprehensive Spending Review, you have the chance to make your views known to David Willits, the Science Minister. Um, Janet Finch will also be on the panel, and Philip, Philip Greenish. This is an event um, chaired by Mark Henderson from The Times at the Royal Institution in the evening, a debate uh, about the future of science funding. So please come along to that. Thanks very much for your support.